Shabbat Shalom. Please can we bow ahead and ask God's blessing on this Bible study? Heavenly Father, Creator God, the Almighty, I am that I am, the one who is, who was, and who is to come. We thank you, we worship you, give you all the adoration and grace and glory for all that you continue to do in our lives. Thank you once again for the blessing and the privilege of seeing another day, another Sabbath that you have made that we should rejoice and be glad in you. We thank you for all our brothers and sisters in different parts of the world who are honoring today, either by the ability to come together to fellowship and to worship you, or they are doing so in their homes or fellowshiping with the brethren virtually because of the inability to gather together as you commanded. Father in heaven, as many as are still on their way to different places of worship, we ask that you order their steps safely. And in all that we're going to do today, Almighty God, please inspire us, guide us, and let your blessing be upon us. And at the end of it, we'll continue to glorify your name and go home blessed and enriched and enhanced and empowered for the week ahead to come. We ask all this and thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 For this, uh, today's Bible study, I want to look at a topic that should probably not be uh, a big surprise to us, but there are people who often, uh, today, these days now, watch our live streaming and read a lot of our materials and they often ask questions. And also among ourselves, sometimes questions also come up. In the last three weeks, and even this past one week, some of those things come up. And then events that happen around us in our community, in our environment, often makes it necessary for us to revisit things we know before, so that at least we can be uh, uh, refreshed in our understanding and knowledge of them. And perhaps maybe we have those around us who may ask questions of us, we might be in a position to better be able to give an answer of the reason of the hope that's in us. So I want to look at the topic that I've titled, Should Christians Tithe and Give Offerings? Should Christians Tithe and Give Offerings? Majorly, I'm going to be looking at the concept and the subject of tithe as well as offerings. There are two different things, I hope we know. To Christians today, tithe and give offerings. Because it's a growing fad among many Christians today that there is no need for the New Testament Christian to tithe. There are those who believe that tithing is outdated, is old covenant, and therefore not required by Christians. In fact, they'll tell you that Christians should give more than tithes. Not 10%, they should give more. If it's 50%, 60%, some will use the word bountiful offerings. I believe, therefore, it negates tithes. And then there are those who believe that all God expects of us is nothing but to give tithes. He asks us to pay tithes. Seven times a year, during the three seasons of the Holy Days, anything else after that is totally unnecessary. It's out of whack, it's out of sync, it's unrequired. Especially maybe in an environment or, a or an economy that things are not that easy. So we are not required to do more than God has asked of us. Our duty is to just pay tithes and that's it. Offerings is not necessary. So I want us to look at this critically and study the scriptures so that we can understand what the Bible says. So I'm going to go about this because it's quite a large subject. I'm going to go about this in the form of question and then we'll answer the question and then we'll read scriptures. And because it's a Bible study, I'll appreciate us reading. And I will want us to at least be very quick on the take to read. So what I'm going to do is uh, we're going to go the way we normally go so that maybe it can be better. If I say it fastest finger, we probably will have a couple of people always reading all the time. And there may be a little bit of some uh, uh, maybe discordance if you want to do that. So we're still going to go from the front row like that and then the second row we keep going like that. So I'll call out the scriptures ahead 
so that those who are going to read, you please open them quickly. If you know you are not going to read, just quickly tell the next person to open. So the first set of scripture, scripture to open, I'm starting from my right, is Numbers 18. Numbers 18, and we're going to read the number of scriptures from verse number 20 to 32. I will be reading it for four verses. So the first set of scripture is Numbers 18, verses 20 to 32. The second set of scripture will be Deuteronomy 14 from verse 22. The second set of scripture, Deuteronomy 14 from verse 22. So the first question I want to ask is this, and this one is something I'll answer generally, which I believe we all know. I may not necessarily have to go through the scriptures, but we'll come by and read that as we go ahead. So what is a tithe? A tithe is simply 10% of our income or assets given back to God for his faithfulness, his mercy, his love, and his grace. That's really what a tithe is. It's an expression of thanksgiving, an expression of faith, an expression of gratitude to God for all he has given us. And we are returning a tenth of our income or assets that we have acquired back to him. That's what a tithe is. What is an offering? An offering is something we choose to give. Again, out of the blessing and gifts that we believe God has given us. Okay? So we pay our tithes because God requires it. We'll come to that later on. So by definition, a tithe is a tenth of our income that is said to be required by God to be given back to Him for all He has given us. It's an appreciation of His faithfulness, His mercy, and His love and His grace. Whereas offerings are extra to that which God has required of us, of that 10%, that we give in, again, abundant appreciation of His grace and His goodness. So the first question, in the Old Testament, were people tightened, the children of God, were they tightened? Obviously, right? Okay? When God gave the law to Moses, to give to the children of Israel after they left Egypt. When God wanted to remind them again and formalize the knowledge that he has given to their ancestors that they may have forgotten because of almost 400 years in Egypt. He included tithing as part of the law. And there were three sets of tithes that God asked them, three different sets. You need to read the scriptures fully to understand to see those three sets. People who sometimes say we're not required to, or that the tithe belongs to us as individuals, or should only be used by the individual, often are talking about different aspects of these three types, okay? So there is a 10% that were, that were given in the Old Testament that is given to the Levites, and please note my words, 10% of income or total you know, increase is given to the Levites, 10% is kept to attend the feasts of tabernacles and the Holy Days, used by the individuals, and 10% once every three years, given either to the Levites again to be administered, to use to administer relief and welfare to the widows, the elders or the needy, or administered by the individuals themselves for those purposes, to those around them that they know and are aware of. So let's quickly look at the scriptures now. Numbers chapter 18 from verse 20. First four verses, probably read five verses please. And the Lord said to Aaron, You shall have no inheritance in their land, nor shall you have any portion among them. I am your portion, and your inheritance among the children of Israel. Behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tithes in Israel, as an inheritance in return for the work which they perform, the work of the tabernacle of meeting. Okay, hold on. The tabernacle of meeting, just to explain as we're going on, the children of Levi, descendants of Aaron, okay? Uh, children of Aaron and the Levites, they do, they have a tabernacle like this, moving tabernacle, the mobile one. The tabernacle of meeting is like this place. The other place where Miriam and the rest are is like the Holy of Holies, that time in the mobile tabernacle. Only once a year can the high priest enter there. So the place where the of Israel used to meet, to have regular worship, is called the tent of meeting, tabernacle of meeting. And the Levites are the ones who take care of it, administer it, and look after it. And they also perform various services in that place. So for their work, God is saying here that he's giving a tent, a tithe of all that Israelites bring together. He's giving it to Levites as their portion. Continue reading, please. Verse 32. 
Hereafter, the children of Israel shall not come near the tabernacle of meeting, lest they be sin and die. For the Levites shall perform the work of the, east of the tabernacle of meeting, and they shall bear their iniquity. It shall be a statute forever, throughout your generations, that among the children of Israel they shall have no inheritance. So, it's only those who are Levites that have the right to actually perform tasks. Cleaning, you know, organizing, arranging, and taking care of things within the tabernacle of meeting. Nobody can just do it anyhow. It's just children of the Levites. If you study more, you realize that the Levites cannot even do that unless they are appointed, okay, and at least from the age of 20 years or more. Okay, continue reading. Sorry. 24. For the fights of the children of Israel, which they offer up as if offering to the Lord, I have given to the Levites as an inheritance. Therefore, I have said to them, among the children of Israel, they shall have no inheritance. Please, 25 downwards. The tithe of the, of the Levites, then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak thou to the Levites, and say to them, When you take from the children of Israel, the tithe which I have given to you from them as your inheritance. Hold on. So the children of Israel will give a tithe of all they have of their increase to the Levites. And God says he's giving the Levites his death. Then God is giving an instruction to the Levites now. Okay? Continue. Then, then you shall offer up a heavy offering of, of it to the Lord as a tenth of the tithe. So they are still supposed to give a tenth of that same tithe. So not just are the Israelites supposed to pay tithe. Even the Israelites, when they are giving all those tithes, because an increase to them, they are supposed to give a heap offering again. A tenth of that same tithe. The tithe of the tithe. Back to... To God, continue. And your heavy offering shall be reckoned to, to you, as that it were, it were the grain of the treasing floor, and as the fullness of the wine press. Hold on, man. So it's not just that the tithes are given to the Levites and it's there to do it as they please, okay? Obviously, it's for the work that they do within the tabernacle of meeting, all the things they have to take care of. But God also requires that they also, even as they take, they must also give a tenth of it as well in the service of that same word. Okay, continue. Thus you shall also offer a heavy offering to the Lord from all, all your tithes which you have received from your children of which have received from the children of Israel. And you shall give the Lord every offering from it to Aaron the priest. Of all, of all your gifts you shall offer up every heavy offering due to the Lord from all the beast from the, from all the best of them and the consecrated part of Okay, them. so the best of the offerings, okay? So they're supposed to also give that to, to God as well. It's a heave offering to God. Something they will actually use and burn and use in sacrifice and in taking care of their responsibilities and serving as priests to the children of Israel. Uh, marvelous. From verse 30 to the end. Definitely. Next person who's going to read. If you're going to read, you should open Deuteronomy 14 ready, okay? Therefore, we shall say to them, when you have lifted up the best of it. Again, when you have lifted up the best of it. So, the, these heap offerings are given to, by Israelites to the Levites. The Levites receive it. They will still take out a tenth of it and give it as, or keep it aside also, as part of what they are also keeping aside for the work of the tabernacle. And then they will give the best of those offerings again as a heap offering again to God. Okay? The best of it. Then the flesh shall be accounted to the Levites as, as the produce of the threshing floor and the produce of the wine press. So whatever offering they are giving, God is taking it as if the, the money or the, whatever it is, the offerings they are collecting from Israelites, whatever they are giving out as, as a tithe of it, God is taking it as if it's their own production, their own productivity. Yes. You may eat it in any place, you and your household, for it is your reward for your work in the tabernacle of meeting. Verse 32 is really important. And you shall bear no sin because of it, when you have lifted up the best of it. But you shall not profane the holy gift of the children of Israel, the less you die. Okay, I remember this, this scripture made a strong impact on me years ago when I started working. And when I first paid my tithes and I gave offerings. And the church then would normally give you a receipt. And we still do, those who want to receive a receipt. And I told them, I remember telling them that, look, what do I need a receipt for? I've given this to God. I'm required to give it to you. What you do with it is up to you. It's 
to you and God, I totally know that God is able to take care of and handle whatever it is. If you misappropriate, that's up to God, isn't it? That's up to God. He says, verse 32, you shall bear no sin because of it. When you have lifted up the best of it, but you shall not profane the holy gifts of the children of Israel as you die. The key here is that the Levites receive the offerings, I mean the tithes, okay, from the people of Israel. They themselves also give a tenth of it to use for their work in the tabernacle of service. Verse 30, uh, 22 of Deuteronomy 14. Speak up now, I know you can speak louder than that. Deuteronomy 14, 22. See, you if shall, you can see, it's written on the screen, you can read from the screen. Mm -hmm. You shall truly, you shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain that the food produced year by year. And you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place where he chose to, to make it's okay, it's okay. The point here is that <laughs> that is the second 10% I mentioned, okay? That God said the people should keep for themselves, and when they go to the keep to keep the feast, they themselves, their family, their you know, friends, servants, whatever, they should eat it by themselves. That's a 10% of their tithe, of their income again, and that tithe they're supposed to spend for themselves and use for themselves. Second time. For the third time, next person should read from verse 28. That's in Deuteronomy 14. Joshua. 28. And the end of the third year, and third year, you shall bring. Oh, the, sorry, yeah, success. Mm -hmm. you, shall, you shall bring the tithe of your produce of that year and store it up within your gates. Continue. And the Levites, because he, he has no portion, no inheritance with you, and the stranger, and and the father and the fatherless and the widow who within your gates may come and eat and be satisfied. That that the Lord your your God may bless you and in all the work of your hands which you do. Okay, so that's the third one. Okay? Once every three years, it ties again. This time it's supposed to be used to take care of the widows, the elderly, and the needy, okay? Those are the three types. Okay. Next question I have to ask and answer is this. So do we still have Levites existing today? I mean, this title was supposed to be given to the Levites. These were descendants of Levi, one of the sons of Aaron, right? What, I mean, of, of Jacob, obviously, but descendants of Levi, all his children, they're Levites. So, who are the Levites? Why, do they still exist today? Why should we even be collecting that? Should we still be collecting tithes and offering as a church when the instruction is that you should go to Levi, okay? Uh, let's look at a couple of scriptures. The scriptures to open here. First of all, I want somebody to open Genesis 14, 18. Then next person you open Psalm 110, verse 4. And the next person, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 20. Genesis 6, 14, 18, Psalm 110, verse 4, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 20. Okay. The Levites were the tribe of Israel descended from Levi, as I said one of the twelve sons of Jacob. And the priests in Israel were a group of men from this tribe. And they are the only ones who have responsibility for serving within the tabernacle and taking care of all the temple worship during the time when the Israelites were in the wilderness. Every priest must be a Levite, but every Levite is not a priest. The priests were selected from among the children of Levi and they were assigned specifically the task of doing that job. I'm not turning there, but you see, when uh, Paul was talking about Christ in Hebrews 5, he was talking about the responsibilities even of ministers and stuff. He said, nobody takes this responsibility upon themselves, but they are actually appointed and given. So somebody cannot come to you and say, you know what, I want to be a Levite, I want to be a priest. Even Christ was assigned by God to do that which he had to do, okay? So those were the Levites. Now, before the Levites came into existence, okay, the concept of giving tithes had already been there. God just formalized it by actually asking the Levites to be the ones collecting it. 
Because the Levites were not just the only people that, because they are not existing after Moses, took them out of Egypt. God said that, let them start giving them tithe. It has been existing before. That is the concept of giving tithe. And later on, I'm not also going to turn there in Hebrews, Paul explained that the children of Levite, while still in their great-great-grandfather's bosom, Abraham, they collected tithes on behalf. They paid tithes on behalf of those who will be receiving it. So the one who's going to actually be the overall high priest, the ultimate forever high priest. We'll come to that later. Let's look at Genesis 14, 18. Joshua. Then the Egyptians uh, shall know that I am the Lord. Genesis, Genesis 14, 18. Genesis. Check on the screen. Leave it on the screen so that we can move fast. Eh? Then Melchizedek. Melchizedek. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God this time. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of God most time, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most time, who has delivered your enemy into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of God. Okay. Prior to this place, we've never seen anywhere where God told Abraham, Isaac, or Israel, or even Noah and the rest of them. When God told them he must give a tenth, isn't it? But obviously, Abraham understood the concept of tithe, right? I want someone to open, okay, this is not my notes, but I think we should read it. Uh, Genesis 26, verse 5. Genesis 26, verse 5. Genesis 26, verse 5. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandment, my statue, and my law. Okay, Abraham obeys my words. Voice. And kept my and commandments. commandments, statutes, and my law. So there are obviously things God talked to Abraham about that were not all written down for us to see. And obviously Abraham must have known about the giving time because he gave the tithe to Melchizedek, king of Salem, king of peace. We'll read later in Hebrews 6, 7 that that Melchizedek was Jesus Christ, receiving tithes from Abraham. And Levi, the of Levi, actually also paid tithes to that high priest forever. Now, remember that the priests acted as mediators between the children of Israel and God. They were the ones responsible for serving the people, and the only one who once in a year, with the blood of the bull that was sacrificed for the people and on their own, entered the throne of God to be able to actually, you know, appear before God and confess people's sins to God. When Christ died, the veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the tabernacle of meeting became open. And the scripture says we can all have the boldness to go before the throne of grace to talk to God directly. No more intermediary needed. Which means that in the new covenant, everyone who has the spirit of God in them is a form of a high priest. Let's look at First Peter. Okay, maybe before that, uh, before we go into that, uh, I mentioned Hebrews 6, right? Hebrews 6, 20. I mean, Psalm 110, verse 4. Sorry. Psalm 110. 110. Psalm 110. Verse 4. Okay, Psalm 110, verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a prince forever. Priest. A prince. A prince. Priest. A priest. A priest. Forever according to the order of men. Melchizedek. Of course, it's a prophecy from verse 1. It says, He's talking about Christ. He's a priest forever, according to the order, order of Melchizedek. Not according to the order of Aaron or Levi this time, but according to the order of Melchizedek. Jesus Christ is our new high priest in the new covenant. And he's a priest before God forever. And therefore, all who serve under him in administering and ministering to the needs of the temple, the spiritual temple, the people of God today, are high priests according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, while all Levites are the ones that are taxed with res responsibility or accepting tithes, but not all Levites are priests, who therefore are the ones collecting and administering those tithes. The same way, while all Christians are a royal priesthood before God, a holy nation, and we are all called to be kings and priests, and as we have the Spirit of God, we have the boldness to go before God, so to say, what the priests used to be able to do, the only ones to do in those times. All of us still are not ministers within the temple of God, are we? 
all of us are not assigned the task of working within the, in quotes, the tabernacle of meeting and the work of the ministry that has been given to the disciples and to the children of God by Christ, isn't it? There are still a group, just as we have a group of people among the Levites who serve as priests, you still have a group of people within that royal priesthood who still serve in that capacity. Um, let me just quickly ask us to read uh, Hebrews 6.20. It's still it. Paul was still making allusion to um, Psalm 110. Hebrews 6, verse 20. Where the foreigner has entered. Oh, God, don't come. Don't pass. Come on down. It's okay. <laughs> Okay, so he's talking there about Jesus Christ, the forerunner. Who goes? I mean, forerunner means there are many more than many people serving and doing this work, right? The first person to go ahead and serve in this capacity is the forerunner. Say, Christ entered for us, having become the high priest forever. According to the order of Mekisele. Now, chapter 7 of verse 11. Hey, Jero, continue reading. Chapter 7 from verse 11. If you are tired, let joy read. Therefore, if perfection be a truly levitical priesthood, for under the people receive the love, one further need was there, that another priest should rise according to the order of Mekisele. And not be accord according to the order of the Continue. For the case of being change of intensity, there is also a change of the law. For he for of whom these these things are spoken belongs to the to, to another, another tribe, from which no man has officiated officiated as the Okay. You read is a long long scripture. You read the rest of this chapter, you hear Paul is here talking about the fact that the priesthood and the responsibility of serving God's people. God transferred from the Levites to Jesus Christ and those who minister under the priesthood of Jesus Christ according to the order of Melchizedek. That's what Paul was talking about here. So do we have Levites today? In a spiritual sense, the question also should be, do we have Israelites today? Because the promise given was given to Abraham and his descendants, isn't it? And the same way we become partakers of the promise given to Abraham through the seed, Jesus Christ. The same way the priesthood also was transferred from Levi to Jesus Christ. And those who serve according to the order of Melchizedek, Jesus Christ, within the new covenant, are those who are the spiritual Levites today, responsible for therefore collecting tithes and offering. I spent a little bit of time on this. The question to now ask is, do we have those responsibilities? Or is everybody in the new covenant, the church of God, are they all Levites and priests? And therefore, since everybody is responsible to collect tithes and offering, then there is no need for anybody to, to pay tithes and offering. Let me just ask us to read a couple of scriptures to show that there is a, that same organization and structure within the body of Christ. And there are those who serve within that temple in the order of Melchizedek, according to that order. Okay? Um, first one, Acts chapter 6, verse 2. This is... The second one, 2 Timothy 2.24. I hope you are noting. Acts 6, verse 2. 2 Timothy 2.24. 1 Peter 5.3. And then Ephesians 4. Again, let me say it again. Acts chapter 6, verse 2. 2 Timothy 2.24. 1 Peter 5.3. Ephesians 4. From verse 11. So, Acts 6, verse 2. This was after Christ had died and the disciples were together. And the work was seemingly, the people were seemingly growing. Acts 6 2. Then in 12, someone the multitude of the You read the four. Mm -hmm. And said, It is not desirable that we should live the word of God and serve him. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the So there was a kind of organization and structure within the Christians. Even shortly after Christ had died and the people were just beginning to grow, there was organization already. There were those who were ministers. 
I will not turn there because if you look at Acts 15, there was a council held in Jerusalem when all the elders and ministers had to come together to agree on the doctrines that would be taught within. And they come to it, they came to a decision and they had to write letters and say, take it to all the different churches and let them read it there. Let people know this is what we have decided. And if anybody is arguing or contending with you, tell them we have no other tradition within the churches of God. Paul used that word many, many times when he's talking about points of doctrine, okay? Um, next person to read, please. Timothy, as I have said. Second Timothy chapter 2, 24. Who's reading? Kelvin. I'm supposed to have, have you read? You should have read before. You read, read now. It's not you supposed to read. Sorry, Joy finished reading, right? <laughs> so you should be Kelvin now. And the servant of the Lord was not spoiled, but be gentle to all, able to teach patience. Read on. Read on. It's correcting those who are in the position. If God perhaps regard them with so that they know the The point here is that there are servants, isn't it? Within the body of Christ, within the temple of God, within the people of God, whose task is to oversee and work with the people and serve God on behalf of, you know, the church of God, so to say. There are those who are like that. Um, 1 Peter 5.3. Next person should be ready to read Ephesians 4. No has been Lord over those entrusted to you, but being examples of the flock. Continue. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory. Obviously, you have a chief shepherd. Then you have other less chief shepherds. Is it not? Sub chief or lower shepherds. A chief is like saying the lead. Your grandmother, that must be some other. People a little bit under, isn't it? Okay, so there is still that structure, and there's still that same service that's going on, in serving the ministry, serving the people of God, under the order of Melchizedek, Jesus Christ, this time. Okay, Ephesians 4, from verse 11 to 12. Bobby. So Christ Himself gave the apostles. Sorry, next question should open 1 Corinthians 9. Okay, continue. So Christ himself gave the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists, the pastors and the teachers, to equip his people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up. Okay, so you see, within the church of God, there's still that hierarchy. Time will not permit me to go into the different hierarchy, maybe one day of use as Bible study, and they have significance. Different hierarchy within the Levitical priesthood, and, they are, and the way they serve within the temple of God. That still continues today. First Corinthians 9, from verse 1. Here, this is Paul talking and defending his role as an apostle and his responsibility to actually have the right to be taken care of and be subsisted by the offerings and the tithes that are provided by, by the body. But he said he chose to not be somebody who is like that. Just like in the church today, you have those who are salaried ministers and non-salaried ministers. And yet they are full-time ministers as well. The same way Paul was saying it. This is a long one, so you have to read quickly. From verse 1 to 4. The next person from verse 5 to 8. Am I not an apostle? I can't hear you. Am I not an apostle? Now we are. Yes. <laughs> Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Am I not saying Jesus Christ are Are you not my Lord? I am not an apostle. He's actually defending his rights to actually take care of himself from the tithes and offerings that are provided by the, by the, by the church. That's what he's defending here. Long story. Next person. Five to eight. Amadin. Can we hang? Do we have no right to take along the believing wife, as do, all, as do also the other apostles, the daughters of the Lord and Savior? He's saying that in the work of the ministry, as it goes around ministry, is it not his right to actually have his wife with him? Moving around, be supported by the church. Obviously, 
the tithes and offerings given by the church as he goes about doing his, his job. Because he said, Peter and James, Jesus Christ's brother, do the same thing, and probably there are other people who do so. In their work of the ministry as they oversee various churches, they have their wives who go around with them, and they are supported and they are taken care of by the, by the church. He's saying, don't I have that same right? Continue. Oh, is this only so what law is it referring to? The law that says Levites have no what? Inheritance and they're not supposed to own anything and they're supposed to be taken care of and all that the children of Israel bring for, forward as tithes and offerings should be theirs. Because that is what, you know, God says is going to be their portion for serving in the tabernacle. Next person. 9 to 14. For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not take the Lord your God in vain. Is it oxen God is concerned about? Or does he say, it all together for our sakes, for our sakes no doubt? For our sakes no doubt, exactly. That he who plows should plow the work, should, should do work, should plow in hope. Exactly, he who he who crushes uh, uh, in hope should be partaker of his hope. Exactly. Yeah, continue. Twelve to fourteen. Continue. Oh, okay, stop. Don't be. If all are Okay, so we do have those who we can say are the spiritual Levites today within the Church of God who can actually accept the tithes and offerings and administer it in the work of serving God and the people of God and in taking care of the temple. Okay, next question I want to ask and answer is. What are tithes the same things as offerings? Are tithes the same things as offerings? We'll come to see later now whether we're going to supposed to keep it again in the New Testament. Now, to, to answer that question, I want us to open Exodus chapter 30. The first person will read from verse 12 to 15. Exodus chapter 30 from verses 12 to 15. Then the next person will read Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 6 and 17. The third person will read 1 Chronicles 22 from verse 5. I will say it later. Okay. So Exodus 30 verse 12 to 15 is the first one to read. First, tithes and offerings are not the same. Scripture constantly will separate them. Tithes are things that God requires. A tenth of your increase that God requires. It's like your rent. Does, is it obligatory for you to pay rent? Yes. You must pay rent. Your, your landlord is not going to beg you. Please, if you like, if it's okay, if you feel like, can you pay my rent? Right? But if you have the gates in your compound or the wall in your house, maybe the paint is spilling. Can the landlord demand that, you know what, give me money so that I'll paint the wall? He cannot. If he's going to ask it of you, it's going to be voluntary, isn't it? Maybe that's not a good example. That's why the Bible uses, we use the word pay tithes and give offerings. God requires a tithe, but he asks that we give offerings. That's a voluntary thing, okay? And in the Old Testament, yes, they were separated. So let's read. Yes, please, Eunice. Now we have. When you take the stuff of Israel, for their number, then every man shall give a ransom for himself to the Lord. When you number them, 
that there will be no plague among them on the number of them. Continue. This is what everyone among those who are known about shall be. Half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary. The shekel is 20 gerahs. The half shekel shall be an offering to God. Read out of 15. Everyone included among those who are numbered from 20 years old and above shall give an offering to the Lord. The rich shall not give more and the poor shall not give less than half the shepherd. Then if you give an offering to the Lord, make to make a comment for yourselves. Okay. Now, there's a reason I'm asking us to read this. Apart from tithes, there are other offerings that God actually also require from the people. This one I had us read is called the soul offering. Okay? When they are doing a census to count the people, remember Moses offended God one time when he wanted to count the number of soldiers and things like that he had. Because it was like, you know, I want to see how well I've done. So, because people must recognize that God is the one who blesses them and gives them increase. When you try to say, I want to see what I have and things like that, you are almost taking ownership and responsibility for your growth and increase. So God says when they are doing a census, so that there won't be a problem and people will say, ah, we have grown up we are before, we are just 50. Now we are like 120 and there will be no pride in them. Again, because people who are physical and weak, God actually asks them that everyone that should count, especially 20 years and above, an adult who can stand on his own, God requires what's called a soul. And guess what? Everyone is required to pay it. Whether you are rich or you are poor, it's like the temple task. You know when Jesus Christ was born and the parents took him to imprison him, you know they have to still give an offering, isn't it? The simplest, the cheapest offering they have to give, two total doses. And that kind of offering is voluntary. So it's a function of how much you can afford. So even in this one, for example, that we just read, the soul offering, everyone is expected to pay it. And it says it doesn't matter whether you are rich or poor. There's a minimum that everybody should pay. Now, there are other offerings that we're supposed to give. And the amount is up to us. Next person, please. Deuteronomy chapter 12. From verse 6. From verse 6. There you shall take your bronze offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the heap offerings of your hand, your fowl offerings, your fuel offerings, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks. Now, hold on, Jerry. You notice it says, what did this start with? Your tithes, I mean your bond offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the heave offerings of your hand, your vowed offerings, your free will offerings, the first one of your herds and flocks. These are not just your second tithe, but every other thing you choose to. This addresses the concept where I want to go to the feast. And there are people who will say, well, I want to go to the feast. Let me just keep in my second tithe. Nothing else. So that when it's time to look at the feast, they can come and say, well, I've kept my second title, and my second title is just this, and it's not enough, so we need support. Of course, God says we should provide support to those who have been faithful, and their second title is not enough. Actually, the church makes that provision. God says you should be generous and be your brother's keeper. What the Bible did say is that if your second title is not enough, what is it you should do? Keep it. Add next year's own to it, and then go keep the first. But in the concept, the principle of be your brother's keeper, isn't it? So if I have excess, let me bring it up so that I can use it to support one another. And I'm not withholding my hand from being generous to my brother, okay? So there are those who will not even think, okay, for the fees, I'm supposed to require maybe 30K. If I look at my second time, based on my income last year, Maybe I just do a hand job, and jobs don't come all the time. Or maybe I'm on a salary, and I can at least specify how much my job is. Or I'm a contractor, and contract sometimes it's late paying me. And from last year or two years ago, I don't think I, I want more than this. You know what? Anytime I get a job, or I get paid, I think after paying my second time, let me choose to add something else. Maybe I'll add at least 2% extra. Or I'll just, once in a while, once I get some really good job, I will add something else. This is your offerings. It could be vowed, it could be free will, whatever it is. You add to it so that again you can keep the feast. Samson, read verse 17, please. Yeah, 
you may not eat within your gates the type of your grain or your new wine or your oil of the firstborn of your herd and your flock of any of your offerings which you vow of the free will offerings or of the heave offering of the hand. It's in. But you must eat them before the Lord your God in the place which he, the Lord your God, chooses. You and your son and your daughter and your male servant and your female servant and the Levite who you in the day of gates. And you shall rejoice for the Lord your God in all to which you put your hands. Okay. It's okay. The point there is, God says, when you kept all these tithes and all that offerings which are freely added to your second tithe, and still, for some reason, you are not able to attend the feast. Those they are told, even though it's yours to use and chop leave all of them in your house. It says, no, you don't do that. You keep them. But from other things that God has blessed you with, really enjoy yourself and keep your feast at home. But the ones you have kept aside to attend the feast, don't spend them in your house. Even though it's yours to spend, isn't it? But make sure you only spend them and use them, keep them, for yourself, your, your children, your servants, your friends, or whatever, at the place where God has put his name. Point is, apart from tithes, there are offerings, separate offerings. First Chronicles 22. Maybe we'll not read there. Actually, it's talking about when David was making preparations for Solomon to build the temple. Okay? To take care of the temple. Oh, it wasn't just the tithes that the people were bringing forward and that they used. Oh, there were offerings. God actually was... But David said he has kept aside from his own pocket resources to make sure when it's time to build the temple, it will be magnificent. It will befit God. And then if you read further down, all the way to verse about 11, therefore, 11, 12, 13, 14, he was talking to the people that, look, Solomon is a young man, you know, he doesn't know much and doesn't have much experience. You guys, if you have skills, you have abilities, you have talents, support him. And provide for him abundantly. So that when he builds the temple, it will be indeed magnificent. Okay? Okay. I've already answered this question that was tithing something that God gave only to the genome of Israel. Obviously, as I said, Genesis, you know, Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek. Apart from Abraham, can we know of anyone before Moses who talked about tithes? Jacob. Exactly. When Jacob was running away, to Laban, after deceiving his father and getting his brother's blessing. At Bethel, where he had that vision, you know what he promised God? Look, if you are going to be with me and guide me and bless me in everything I do, see, in terms of everything I earn, I'm going to give it to you. That was probably, before, that was definitely before we had Moses come along and they gave the, the law of Titan to the children of Israel. So definitely, of course, it's been there long before. And in case someone tells you that, well, in the New Covenant, all those kind of laws is over. You know, Genesis 3, 7, Galatians 3, 17, Paul said, a covenant that was made 430 years later does, with Abraham does not negate things that were already done before then. I'm not going to come to that place. Anyway. Okay, next scripture for us to... Um, read Matthew 23 23 okay Matthew 23 23 and um, Luke 11 42 and the question is that is there any mention of tithes in the New Testament is there a specific command to pay tithes in the New Covenant in the New Covenant I will answer that question, yes and no. There is no specific command in the New Testament that says, in terms of your increase, like you mentioned, you know, in the Old Testament, you must pass across and give to the children of Israel. There's no specific command like that. But yes, Christ himself did affirm that pain of tithes is something that a child of God, a Christian, a believer should do. Matthew 23, verse 23. Matthew 23, 23. And then somebody to next person to open Luke 11, 42. Who's reading? It's 
Stella. Wolves to use hides and Pharisees. We can hear you. Wolves to use hides and Pharisees. Okay, Jesus said these are hypocrites. They are careful to pay tithes of even the smallest herb and tea, but they neglect those who are that are, those things that are worthier. Justice, mercy, and faith, isn't it? He said, this you ought to be to have done. Which means you're supposed to still be making sure you're as careful to pay your tithes without leaving the others undone. I mean, you should be paying more attention to those weightier matters of the law while still not leaving or ignoring paying your tithes. Luke 11, 42. Same thing said there, okay? Exactly. So that is the closest we can say. But you know there are so many scriptural principles in the Old Testament that were not specifically counseled in the New Testament. For example, um, is there any way anywhere in the New Testament where God said, Thou shalt make no graven image of anything in heaven and on earth, and under the earth or in the sea, and not bow down to them? Anywhere, or is it written anywhere in the New Testament? Does it mean we can do that in the New Testament? Does it mean it's done away with? Is there anywhere where the Ten Commandments, all Ten Commandments are listed in the New Testament? Actually, there's a place that Jesus and the rich young ruler and also Paul mention one, two, three, or three, four, five, and did not mention all of them. Does it mean those parts that are not specifically mentioned in the New Testament? are no more responsible for us to follow. Obviously not. Okay? Obviously not. The fact that Jesus Christ said that they should be paying attention to mercy, judgment, and faith without leaving the careful attention to pain of tithes undone shows that it is still something we're supposed to do. Okay. In the New Testament, do we see any evidence of them giving offerings? Obviously there is. They gave offerings. And they gave liberally, fully. Okay, we're quickly going to read a couple of that. Philippians chapter 4 from verse 10. Philippians 4, 10. The Phil Phil Philemon 1, 4 to 7. Philippians 4, 10 and Philemon 1, 4 to 7. Who's reading? Philippians, Philipp Philippians 4, 10 to 14. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, who's reading? Okay, let me read from verse 11. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound everywhere in all things. I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Paul was talking about them that they supported him. They did things for him that were not required out of their own need. That's talking about offerings, obviously. Philemon, who's going to read Philemon? 1, 4 to 10. Pause. This Philemon happens to be a fairly well-to-do individual. Tradition says the church in Ephesus frankly meets in his house. He was well-to-do enough that he even had slaves working for him. And Onesimus was a slave who ran away from his house. And Paul was writing this letter to him to appeal to him to take him back into his house. And Paul was saying, this guy, you have been very generous. You have been very good and showing love to the rest of the saints. 
the rest of it, it talks about how this guy, okay, maybe read, read verse 7, please, who is reading? For we have great joy and consolation in Okay. The hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. The word used there is in times of somebody who uses his means to provide some form of comfort and relief to those who are part of the church within his environment. So yeah, the Christians in the time of Christ were still giving offerings. They were still using their resources to bless the brethren and to bless the church and what they are doing. Okay. Um, I think we should read uh, maybe one more scripture. First Corinthians 9 from verse 7. First Corinthians 9 from verse 7. Who's reading? Okay, I think I read part of this already. Read, uh, uh, read um, sorry, Galatians chapter 2. Corinthians 9 6. Okay. You read 2 Corinthians 9 6. 2 Corinthians 9. making collections for the saints. If you read a little bit back, you read what it's saying because of the collections for the saints. And God referred, you know, Paul told them to prepare and keep their gifts, their offerings ahead. It's not talking about tithes here. That's why it's not going to have a certain amount. And he's saying you can give according to your means, okay? Um, let me just quickly jump. This is this seems a little bit uh, well. The question I have to ask next is this. What if someone says giving a tithe becomes a ritual? You know, it becomes a ritual, something you just do by rules. Okay? Does that make it wrong? You know, just because you are giving a tithe and it becomes a mere ritual. You know, when you, we come to church every Saturday, isn't it? And we sing and we worship. Does it mean it's a dead ritual? Because something we do, you know, regularly. When you wake up in the morning and you pray, it can actually also be a ritual, isn't it? What differentiates it? It's the heart that is inside it, isn't it? When you do something and your heart is not in it, and your motive for doing it is not one of genuine worship and love of God, then it becomes a dead ritual. We can come to church all we want. We can read the Bible all we want. We can pray all we want. And if we're just doing it by rote, without no good intention, no motive, no genuineness in it, no heart in it, then it becomes a dead ritual. So when you say I'm giving a tithe, it's a, it's a requirement that I'm giving, it doesn't mean it's a ritual. We're simply doing what God has asked us to do. You know how it can become a ritual? My salary or my income or once in six months or once in two months or once in a week I get a job and I do and my income is like 6750 and therefore my tithe is 670 naira. And I'm looking for a 30 naira change so that I can just make, I, I must give 670 naira. I can't give 700 naira. I'm looking for 30 naira change. 
And then, if you can't say, you, oh, um, brother, success, I mean, do you have 30 naira? Can you change 100 naira, 50 naira for me? Because I'm, I want to just add 20 naira. So my, my time is 670, but I have only 700 naira. Now it becomes a ritual, and it's of no what? That it's of no good. That's when it can become a ritual. So many good things we do that does not have heart. And we do it just because, mm, that, yeah, let me just do it, and you know, because that's when it becomes, it becomes a ritual. Another question that often comes is, what if I can't afford to give? What if things are so difficult for me? If you can't say you cannot give a tithe, then you are in trouble. <laughs> you are in serious trouble. Because Mary and Joseph, the parents of Jesus Christ, we don't think about it. There's this movie we should watch, The Chosen. How many of you have started watching The Chosen? It's one of the best movies you can watch that depicts Jesus Christ and the people and the lives of people around him in a more realistic way, unlike the typical story of Jesus that you've seen. Even the representation is an amazing, it's an absolutely free movie. You can download it as an app on Play Store or on the Apple Store. It's available, I believe, on YouTube. It's absolutely an amazing movie, The Chosen. Okay, they're doing season three now. Um, the parents of Jesus Christ were so poor, they could not even afford to give a proper thanksgiving offering for the fruit of the womb. The child that opens your womb is supposed to give an offering, actually, to God, you know, for that. They had to give the minimum possible, just two total doses. But they still gave it. They could have said, you know, we are poor. And this is the Lord. I mean, it was God who told us the child was going to be big. We can't therefore afford to. Tithing is not to be given because we have enough or because we are stable. It's an expression of faith in a God who is the provider. We know the story of the widow's might. I'm not going to read it. There are people who enter the temple, and these are even offerings that they're given, right? People who are out of their excesses. You know, this guy had 100000 in the bank account, and he came and he's giving 5000 as offering. Easily, no big deal. And a poor widow came in. Could she afford to give? She couldn't. From the story, Jesus Christ said her giving was more sacrificial and acceptable before God than all those people who had. The concept of we don't we can't give because we don't have enough shows a misunderstanding of who provides for us in the first place and who gives us in the first place and the one who gives us the ability to produce to produce wealth. Okay? I'm not going to go into all the scriptures on that. What if you also choose not to give? You know, I can, it's difficult, but I'll give later. Okay? In the instructions of the Levites, the Levites were told to take the best and give it to God. In later on in the sermon, I will address some topic. There is something for taking off the top the first fruits and giving it to God. There's something for that. You don't give God the dregs. You don't give God the remains. You don't, it's like you cook food. And there's a governor coming to meet you. And you have the food. This is the whole food here. The governor sent you money. I'm coming to visit you, okay? Take this money, make food for me. And then you make the food and it's there. And then you take out all you want. Give your wife, give your child, give everybody else. You now leave the remaining part of it. You say, what is left now? Okay, this is almost about one tenth of what I have given. Let me give it to the governor. You don't take out of the bottom. That's why in Malachi 3a, I'm not reading there, says, God says, you guys are robbing me. And he says, okay. they were saying, in what way, how can we rob you, God? He says, you are robbing me in tithes and offerings. You are robbing me, he says, in tithes and offerings. A place in, in uh, Exodus says, don't even delay to bring your tithes into the storehouse. There are those who feel, you know, I don't think I will have this thing I want to do this week or this month or um, until I get me when I get the next income. I'll pay my tithes, you know, together. You don't have the right to do that. You take your tithes off the top. You don't sort yourself out and then give God the dress that what I feel, okay, I think it should be about. We do that, we are robbing God and we are doing ourselves a service because God said, I'll talk more about that in the sermon. God says when you rob me, you are actually cheating yourself. When you think you can't give, you're actually robbing yourself. And he said, test me. 
Imagine the God says, test me. It's like me coming to Joshua and say, Joshua, I want to prove to you that I am I'm generous, okay? So, I want you to give any amount. Any amount you give, I will double it. Where? Okay? Test me. Then, yeah, Joshua, how much do you want to give? Bring some money out. Play, pledge it. Any amount you give, I will double it. Is God good for that? When the Englishman says, am I good for it? It means, can I fulfill what I have said? So if God tells you, bring my tithes and my offerings into my house and test me. Is it good enough to do that? Is it good for it? Can it do what he says it will do? He says, see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour down to you. Is God good for that? Is his word good enough to say, test me yet? We can't afford not to tithe. We can't afford not to give offerings. Bottom line, conclude. The bottom line. God is a great king. He is our redeemer, our Lord, our God, our everything. Our lives are literally in his hand. He blesses us with everything. Provides us with everyone, everything, whatever it is that we need. He says, I claim a tenth of your income. And as you freely choose, support one another, the body of Christ, the work of God. What I'm trying to do here on this planet, resources, your time, your energies, your increase in whatever form according to you. And he says, if you do it sparingly, then you will reap sparingly. If you sow sparingly, you will reap sparingly. If you give generously, then I will give you generously as well. Offerings, as much a requirement by God as well as tithes. Except that tithe, he demands it. And offerings are things we give. You know what Christ said about the unprofitable servant? Raphael, you agree, right? You know what your unprofitable servant is? He just did like this. He did like this. Yes, I know. <laughs> when you have done what is asked of you, what did what Jesus Christ said? Tell myself, I am an unprofitable servant because I have only given that which I am asked of. What is my duty to give? So, Christians are required or expected to pay tithes and give offerings. But because it is a function of faith, we cannot mandate, we cannot demand that people do it. I keep chasing people up and down. Have you given offerings? Did you pay tithes? How often do you give offerings? How often? We can do that because it's a function of personal faith and relationship with God. Whatever is not of faith, it is what? It is sin. But God does attach blessings to those who recognize his laws, his will, and they do the needful because they recognize his sovereignty in their lives. Do we have questions? Do we have questions? Okay. We will start the service by... Talk, 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 talk. Okay.